Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Situation Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence environments. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. In this episode, I continue my interview with Captain John Lightly. John serves as a member of the Youngstown, Ohio Fire Department, where he's been a veteran of 13 years. Youngstown, Ohio Fire Department has eight stations and a sworn strength of 135 firefighters. John's married and has twin daughters that are in the third grade. So as I mentioned in the last episode, you can imagine how hectic John's life is and how much I appreciate him sitting down and sharing his close call survivor story with me where he almost died as a result of being caught in a flashover. For reasons that will become obvious during the interview, I titled this episode Three Feet from Death and dedicate it to all firefighters who've been caught in flashovers and did not live to tell their story. In this two-part story, you'll learn how John conducted his size-up that allowed him to determine that the clues and cues that formed his situational awareness indicated that he was probably uh, making entry in an occupied structure. You'll hear how the flashover occurred in two minutes upon entry. This is a recurring theme that I see in flashover casualty incidents, how communications challenged uh, their their in their understanding of what was going on among crew members, how John experienced tachypsychia, or slowing down of time when the flashover occurred. You'll hear John describe how he felt intuition in the form of a sick feeling in his gut and a feeling that someone had punched him in the stomach. And uh, John will also talk about self-speak, the neurological phenomenon where we talk to ourselves during high-consequence situations, only John didn't call it self-speak, and I'll let him explain what he called it and why. And then how John's entry, uh, the first two times that he made entry into the house, was under the premise of assuming the risk of being a firefighter, uh, yet he admitted to me that his entry, the, uh, the third time, he was actually creating a risk and not assuming risk. So let's get caught up with part two of our interview with Youngstown, Ohio Fire Captain John Lightly as he picks it up where we left off from episode 22 and he is about to experience the flashover. So thinking about how fast this fire was moving, thinking about my objective, which was searching for life, um, it was, I can't say forcing me to go back in because I was making the conscious decision to go back into that, um, into that structure, but it was spurring me on and not sounding like some great hero, but I think if there's no other reason why we should go into a, a burning home, it's obviously when there's a high likelihood of a, of a victim. If there was a chance at a rescue, this was our best opportunity. Um, I really, I truly don't care who gets the rescue. I've been involved um, in a couple. I've been involved in a couple where the outcome wasn't um, good. I don't care who gets the credit. Um, I'd just as soon put out the fire, to be completely honest. I'm a pump guy. But I knew that if the cards were going to be in our favor, um, all the um, all the elements were there to have a successful outcome. But the third time I went in, I'm down on my hands and knees. I made it in about maybe three feet. And I had the thought of, wow, where's all this heat coming from? Um because only seconds before I'd been in an upright position and I'd been 10 to 12 feet in the door. As I turned to look to my right, which I knew led towards the back of the house, I was looking underneath the smoke layer and I'm having the conscious thought of, wow, it's a lot better down really close to the carpet. And as I'm thinking that, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, wow, even the carpet's getting kind of warm. Um, so I, I was in the middle of a, of a 
rapidly changing environment, and I was aware of it. Um, I truly, truly knew something was happening. But I guess I was still um, holding out hope that, you know, suddenly it would alleviate itself or the situation would go away. I'd be able to continue my job. Oh, I heard hold, one hold, on, loud... hold on, hold on, hold on. Sure. You were thinking that somehow the situation would get better? Correct. Uh, either By what in the means? Form of, either in the form of um, a vertical vent uh, and the heat lifting, okay. um, improving visibility, or my guys um, who were only a few feet away from me outside having the hose line in full operation, and as I was uh, kneeling on the floor, I'd, I'd hear the, uh, the beautiful sound of the, the hose line opening up. Okay. Um, so I knew um, scientifically that, yeah, the situation is not going to get better unless there's some type of firefighter intervention. Okay. But and that's what you were thinking my... was going to happen. Correct. Like, you, Correct. You knew the truck company was there. You knew they were setting up the vent. You knew your crew was extending the hose line, and you were of the mindset, um, perhaps wishful mindset, that um, some relief was going to come to you quickly by one of those two teams um, doing their magic, and that was going to make the conditions better for you. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I had I had complete trust in my guys. I had complete trust in the ladder company. I knew that um, if things were lighting up in another portion of the house, I knew the chief had uh, done his 360. And uh, we have um, we have safety conscious uh, chiefs as far as radio conditions to the guys' interior. Um, if the chiefs don't see. Um, the, the, the fire changing to uh, the white smoke to the steam, they call, they, they, you know, John, what's going on in there? You know, why is the fire still progressing? Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard any of those radio communications, so I was very comfortable in knowing that the rest of the house wasn't involved. Okay, you had a radio? Um, yes, yes, it was I on? Did. Um, it was on. On the uh, right on channel? The on the correct channel. Okay, yes. was there any of this communication and you just didn't hear it, or there just wasn't any communication? Well, that's that's the million-dollar question. I have to logically assume that the communication was taking place um, between the pump operator and the guys extending the line um, because guys do talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I have to assume that um, the battalion chief was giving assignments over the radio because that happens at every fire. Mm -hmm. I believe that he did not communicate to me because um, I do, um, I can block out a lot of radio traffic, um, but there's that one voice that you always seem to hear, and that's usually, you know, the chief. But I can't say for certain. I think. Uh, I read one time that a study had been done that 75% um, of the radio communications were missed by the guy on the nozzle, mm -hmm. um, whereas the second guy on the line caught 75% of the communications. Mm -hmm. So even though I didn't have a nozzle, I would have been that potentially been that guy missing 75% mm -hmm. of the uh, communication. Okay, so, so it is possible that he communicated to me and. and because I was so focused on my mission, I was so focused on my job, and rightfully so, you know, but it's possible I missed the communication. Mm -hmm. Did, um, and I know we're getting a little bit ahead in the story, but did you find out later that there was communication um, directed towards you that, uh, that you didn't respond to or you didn't hear? Um, you know, and that might come later in the story, but since we're on the, the topic of communication, okay. what did somebody try to communicate to you and you, and you didn't hear them? It, it was never mentioned one way or the other. Um, because okay. that once the situation took place, we're all back at the station having coffee. Um, you know, that, that subject right or wrong never came up. Okay. Um, I'd had previous fires where we were right in the thick of things and I've had great communication with the chief. Mm -hmm. So going on past practice, 
I would believe, or I would like to believe that if he had called me, I would have heard. Um, mm-hmm. But the world will never know. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you are saying that in normal operations, the chief would have been using his radio to give communications and assignments to other firefighters operating at the scene, and there's a high likelihood that that communication was occurring, even though it wasn't maybe directed toward you, that it was probably occurring, but you weren't really hearing it or paying attention to it or whatever, you know, term that you want to put to it, it, you weren't, it wasn't uh, sinking in for you that other communication was happening? Absolutely. Okay. That's, that's, that's very possible. And another thing that is just as, as possible is all the communication was taking place face to face because the way the, the yard was set up, the parked cars, um, once the chief would have checked the rear of the structure, he would have quickly been back to the front where all the crews had to come. Our chiefs, um, are out at the scene. They're, not, um, um, or sitting in a command vehicle out of the street, mm-hmm. um, which especially with the, such a long drive and such, especially for the long yeah. drive. Yeah. So everybody walking up to that scene would have basically had to pass the, um, the commander. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I would much rather have a face-to-face communication whenever possible, because it. You know, it, it's more clear. Sure. The only downside to that is if all the face-to-face was taking place in the front yard, I'm not hearing anything on the inside. That's right. So that's that's something that, that we do have to make sure if a face-to-face communication is, is important outside, you need to give that um, communication to the guys who may be inside or away from, you know, that communication. And then um, a lot of... A lot of times, we don't do a whole lot of communication in that our assignments are, are pretty well set by SOP, um, and they're pretty well set by crews working together at multiple fires per year. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly don't think we should um, have a policy on every little detail to occur on a fire ground. Um, the far uh, flip side of that coin would be freelancing. We definitely don't want companies just freelancing. But we do a lot of, of nonverbal communication. Um, the chief knows that this captain on the truck, when he's carrying this piece of equipment, this is what he's doing. And the only reason he's going to be carrying that piece of equipment is because it's the right thing to do for that situation. The chief knows that... Um, the second arriving company is getting the water supply. He doesn't have to communicate that um, on right. a on a on the radio. Right. So all these communications, very likely based on all the previous fires I've been to, were taking place. But it's also possible I'll never know if he might have called me to check on conditions, mm-hmm. and I just missed it because I was so focused on my job. Sure. All right. Um, Let's get back to the fire. Uh, Absolutely. The, the smoke is uh, a couple of feet from the floor. It's been a, about a minute to a minute and a half. You're thinking to yourself, man, it's really getting hot in here. And so take it from there. Well, I'm, I'm hunkered down maybe three feet in the door. Um, I remember being on my hands and knees, and then I kind of um, pushed back onto my, um, my legs, kind of like I was getting ready for a tornado drill. And that was because of this pretty good intense wave of heat just coming right down on top of me. I wasn't burning. Um, I had no excruciating pain, but I knew that this was a hot fire. I knew that the heat had dropped. I knew from fire behavior. I knew from previous fires that there was going to be fire over my head um, that I could not see up in the smoke layer. If I'd had a nozzle, I would have opened up, the line directed at the ceiling to begin to begin cooling things down. I turn to my left, and I'm up against the couch. I'm not worried because I know exactly where the door is, 
I know I'm only about three feet away from the door. Um, I've got even in the in the zero visibility now. I've got a good landmark of the couch, and I remember being mask to couch, and I hear a big pop. And at the time, I did not know what it was. Looking back after the event, I know that it was um, one of the two gas cans that were in the room had just um, added proverbial fuel to the fire. It had melted enough to dump um, its con contents out onto the table or the floor, whatever it was sitting on. I know that because I found those after the fact. I'm looking at this couch, and it's it's a kind of a, a tan colored couch. I can it's zero visibility, but I knew it was a tan colored couch. I'm not sure how I can't explain that, but I'm looking at it, and it's time really stood still. It, it was it was surreal. It was really cool, um, actually. I'm seeing wisps of white smoke coming off the couch. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it, that I'm like. This is really cool. This couch is off gassing. <laughs> and I had that I remember having that conscious thought. And I could I could kind of see even in the in the in the bad visibility, I could see several pockets of white smoke off gassing from this tan couch. And then it was like the light bulb went on in my mind and I got slugged over the head with a two by four. Hey idiot. This couch is off gassing. And my thought was, it looks like the couch in the videos that I've seen online. The UL videos, mm -hmm. the, um, the NIST training videos, they mm -hmm. set up that living room, mm -hmm. and you watch Flash Over Occur, and it's like a tan-colored couch. And I always, when I show that video, I play it, then I pause it, and I have the students look closely you can see the couch off gas right before it erupts in flames. I thought, how cool is this? Hey, idiot, this couch is off gassing. I, and finally, for once in my life, I listened to that little voice in my head, and I said, it's time to go. I turned to my left, which would have put me facing the door, and I just remember diving. I dove the full three feet, and as I'm diving, I hear another big pop, a real big, I don't want to call it a bang necessarily, but a real big pop. This wave of heat came crashing down on me as I'm diving through the doorway. Going back to how I described the entrance, three steps up instead of the normal front porch where you have to cross the eight to 10 feet. Mm -hmm. The fact that it was that style of porch kept me from being burned. I know that because as I dove out, I ended up going down the steps. The fireball that resulted from the complete flashover came rolling out the entire door frame and went up. I went down, the fireball went up. Had it been our standard porch, I would have dove out onto the porch, I would have been on the porch floor, and but I would have been burned. Maybe not uh, to the point of death, but I would have been pretty um, severely injured because that fireball would have been coming out across the floor as well. So I was, I was blessed that there was no porch. I dove down, the fireball went up, and I remember as I was hitting the ground and just kind of doing the, the tuck and roll maneuver to my knees, I came face to face with um, a, a guy from another company who had just finished masking up. And we're face to face, and I'll never forget his eyes. He was kind of, kind of humorous. Um, his eyes, you know, they're just bulging out. You know, they look like the cartoon character. His eyes just popping out of his head. And because he saw me dive out and fireball, you know, going right over me, he hollers, are you okay? As he's hollering that, I'm turning. The entire doorway has flame 
eight to ten feet um, coming out and going up. The window to the side of the uh, to the left side of the door, flame, nothing but heavy fire blowing out. Um, I could tell by looking around the corner to the front of the house, flame pouring out the front window, which had gotten um, vented by by one of the truck guys. I saw all this. I said, hmm, that's where I was just a moment ago. Then I turned. I looked at one of my guys who was handing me the nozzle. I said, let's go get this. I went back up, and we put the fire out and find it to the room of origin. The, the fire event had occurred. I knew it wasn't going to get worse because it had already flashed. I'm outside. I'm okay. Let's go put the fire out. Let's go back to work. But the fact that uh, the porch was set up the way it was, the fact that um, we had early warning by the cops going on the burglar alarm, the fact that uh, we had a four-man crew that day, and the fact that um, I believe in uh, divine intervention, that's the reason it was a close call instead of a line-of-duty death for me. Was there a victim inside? There wasn't. It, it's surprising to me. I have no idea why this guy set his burglar alarm and left at, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning, whenever he left, just before the fire. Um, why that boggles my mind completely is because during our search of the rest of the home, we found a pretty extensive um, marijuana operation going on in the basement. Now, what type of grower sets a burglar alarm? I don't know how the burglar alarm went off, but why on earth would you be doing an illegal activity and then advertise it by setting your burglar alarm? Who's going to come? The cops. What do they look for? You know, marijuana. Mm -hmm. But there ended up being nobody inside. Um, like I said, we went in, confined the fire to the room of origin, and it um, went out pretty quickly. Um, a couple other crews pushed past me to start uh, the search of the rest of the house. I was in a position where I was able to tell them which direction to go. So having gone in and um, looked at the layout of the house was of benefit because, you know, I was knocking down the fire. Visibility, of course, went to zero, but we could give them directions on which way to go. Mm -hmm. um, just your standard fire that, uh, you know, another couple seconds, and I don't come back from. Huh. You know, but what? the whole time, I, I honestly, I, I felt calm. I felt very relaxed. And again, that's not to try to pump myself up to somebody that I'm not, but it was what I would consider routine. You know, it wasn't the first time we'd been to a fire. Okay, so um, it was it was routine. The thing that was not routine was, even though I was consciously aware of everything that was going on, was just how fast it really occurred. Mm -hmm. um, um, go ahead. After you bailed out, um, were they then ready with the water? Yes. Okay. What had happened was when they went to extend the hose line, there wasn't good communication between the truck, and, or excuse me, from the pump and the, the engine company on the end of the line. Mm -hmm. The engine guys, the firefighters, took the nozzle off the line because they thought somebody was going to bring them one of the spare sections of inch and three quarter that we carry on the truck. So they they were going to extend the line at the at the nozzle. You've already stretched 200 feet. Um, why add it at the truck? And then you'd still have to now stretch 250 feet. The pump operator, he had the section of hose with him. He knew instantly, or very quickly, I should say, that he needed to extend the line. And he began to extend it at the truck itself. Mm -hmm. So there was a miscommunication between those 
those two uh, groups. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in our SOP that says where you do it. Perhaps there should be. But again, if you go back to my estimation that in 13 years on this department, I've only extended the hose line a handful of times. You know, that's something that doesn't always get written down and put into a policy form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the pump operator quickly uh, added his section. Well, he charged the line again. The guys at the end of the nozzle had the nozzle off mm -hmm. waiting for the hose line to be brought to them. Right. They turned and looked, and they see the hose line filling up as it's coming towards them. Oh, boy. After a couple of choice words... They did the only thing they could, and they tried to put a crimp in the hose mm -hmm. so that they could still put on the nozzle, but it was too late. Even with the two guys, you know, the water pressure overpowered the guys. So now they're trying to control the hose line. I know from um, after incident review, the chief was on the radio hollering it to the pump operator to shut down the line, shut down the line. Well, he shut down the line, but there's still the delay then while it bleeds off a little bit before they could get the hose line attached. Sure. Um, and the can, nozzle back on. Can I so ask a question? Let me delay. ask a question. Uh, so it, it's completely understandable how this would have happened with this disconnect between the operator and the guys on the nozzle, but there's some distance between them, and I'm. What I think I heard you say was that the uh, battalion chief was then calling back on the radio to the pump operator saying, you know, shut it down, shut it down. Yes. Uh, did you hear that? Uh, I heard it because um, that occurred um, after I made my second trip into the house. Okay. I'd come back out. Um, well, you were already back out when that happened. I was back out okay. just at the time. I didn't know exactly what was going on. Mm -hmm. But I could see them fumbling, trying to stop this hose line. Right. And I could see one of them was holding the nozzle. And in my field of vision, um, I could see the battalion chief talking excited. Well, not, I don't want to say excitedly, but on the radio um, transmitting an urgent message. Mm -hmm. I, I was able to, I knew something was going on. I got the details after the fact. But yeah, I saw that. That's when I realized what, the initial problem was and why they hadn't come in to um, put water on the fire. Mm -hmm. So my third trip in, when I only made it a few, a couple feet in, three feet in, I told you I was hunkered down thinking that the situation was going to be quickly alleviated um, because now I had an idea of where they were at in their process. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, all they got to do is screw the nozzle back on and we're good. It should only take two guys 10 seconds to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, I was, I didn't have the details, but that was just another thing that I was aware of, mm -hmm. uh, of for the situation. Um, and certainly there's, there was no fault on, on either of those parties. No. It was just one of those simple miscommunications that uh, potentially, um, you know, could have had um, a little bit more severe outcome. I think looking forward, when I saw that they were having that hose problem, I shouldn't have even gone back in the third time. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I know that my first two times, I'd argue to my dying day that, that they were justified. Uh, did a quick search, came out, went in, finished the primary of the fire room, uh, grabbed a quick layout of, of the structure, came back out. I. I truly believe I can justify those. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what you know. You sign up for when you become a firefighter is a chance to to make a save. You've got to push that envelope, and all the signs and symptoms of there being um, a victim inside were were there. Mm -hmm. um, the third time I went in, I I probably did not need to go in, but I also kind of erred on the side of caution because I only stopped three feet in the door. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm only going to stop three feet in the door, I probably didn't need to enter at all, you know, mm -hmm. but I was, um, well, th this I is made an, my way. 
this is a okay. nice segue to the uh, to the ultimate question that I ask the uh, the uh, people that I'm interviewing, and that is, what uh, what did you learn from this, and the form of lessons that you would now want others to learn through you? So, I don't know how many there would be three, four, five things. You know, what what did you learn from all this? I learned that you could be situationally aware and still have a near miss. So the, the, the lesson in that is how bad is it going to be if you're not aware of the situation? <laughs> if you can get in trouble knowing the situation, you're just you're begging for a disaster if you're not even aware of the situation. Um, so I, I would pass that on to people. My fire behavior training um, in fire school would not have gotten me out of that situation alive. I know that having become an instructor, I've seen the curriculum, I've taught the curriculum, and it is not enough fire behavior in the curriculums to be safe. Mm -hmm. when, when I teach fire behavior, and it's one of my passions, uh, I love teaching it. I I try to spend more time than I'm allotted, much to the chagrin of most of my students. Uh, I try to spend time on the rapid fire events. If you look at at most of the the, I don't doesn't matter if you call them rookie school, fire school, fire science classes. If you look at the standard, basic. Uh, firefighter education, fire behavior class. We spend more time talking about backdrafts. Pretty much everybody can tell you that, that the book, the textbook will tell you, well, if you see uh, smoke-stained windows, you're, you're getting ready for a backdraft. I've never seen smoke-stained windows. Primarily because you can't tell if the, if the, if there's fire and smoke inside a structure, all the windows are covered with soot. So, but we make a big deal about smoke-stained windows, about yellow-gray smoke puffing out of the building. And we spend a lot of time in fire school talking about backdrafts. And it's important. But what percentage of fires actually have a backdraft? Mm -hmm. I would argue very few. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you. percentage. Yeah, I agree with you. But what... What percentage of fires go through the stage of flashover? Well, every one of them, if we don't get there early enough to stop it. <laughs> every one that goes beyond incipient. Right. So why aren't we training more on flashover? Sure, we, we have the flashover simulators, and you get to crawl in, you get to see the development of it, and that's spectacular training. But we do that in a controlled environment. We don't, even our, our burn buildings, our acquired structures, we're, we're putting out training fires with um, props, pallets, straw, um, gas props. I understand that. It's, it's a safer way to do it. It's easier co to control. But when we take students into a, a shipping container that has some pallets and some um, straw on fire, we're not teaching them the speed of which a fire can develop. We're not teaching them how quickly it can go from growth to fully developed. So the reason I was ahead of the game was because of my personal desire to know more about fire behavior. What I got in my, my fire trainings was not enough. I would tell the, uh, the guys and, and the gals out there, if you're going to be a firefighter, you you got to put down some of the um, fun trainings, um, you know, ladder bailouts. They're fun to do. Uh, technical rescue training. It's fun to do. We need to do that. But if we're going to push to go back to the basics, well, the basic is how does a fire start and how does it grow? We need to spend more time training in that. Um, it doesn't do any good to go through a um, – Dave Dotson's uh, reading smoke class if you're not going to apply it. Um, 
you have to get in the videos, you have to read the uh, the UL studies, the NIST studies. Um, I've started reading and highlighting um, NIOSH reports, and when I see a situation that appears to me, just from what I can read in the report, that it had a heavy element of fire behavior, I highlight that in my um, note-keeping um, method so that if I need to reference a situation that included fire behavior, I can quickly pull that up. If you think you're going to um, do just fine without learning more about fire behavior, um, you're just asking for trouble. So I would, I would pass that lesson along. Um, and the, the, probably the other lesson I would um, pass along or attempt to pass along is we got to stop just looking at how pretty the fire looks and, okay, I, I see that the smoke is doing this or I feel the heat is doing this. A lot of times we stop at the looking. We need to carry that out into the application. Okay, if A plus B equals C and we're already at A and B, then we know C is going to occur. What are those steps to prevent C from happening? Or what are the steps to reduce the severity of, of action C? Um, so I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for, but uh, oh, the, those are the things that have stuck with me. Yeah, it's absolutely what I'm looking for. Um, did you get hurt? No, other other than, uh, you know, my pride of <laughs> landing and the guys giving me some grief about it. Um, but the, the companies that, that were closest to the scene or closest to the event, um, it was obvious that something... Um, big or out of the ordinary had occurred. Um, but again, because we got up, we went right back in and put out the fire. It was kind of the mindset of, well, the problem didn't really exist, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and and we, we need to be careful of that. If that situation occurred tomorrow, I'm back on duty tomorrow, I would, I would repeat my actions almost completely. I had a good reason to be in there. I wasn't just being stupid. Um, I was being aggressive, but I wasn't being reckless. I wasn't really reckless until the third trip in. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I tempered that by stopping short because I realized the severity of the situation. Um, but I would, I would go into that situation again. I would change... Um, by adding in some more radio communication. I would change by telling the uh, ladder company to hold off on the ventilation um, for, you know, until that hose line was squared away. But that's also kind of as a result of the recent UL studies that have come out, which weren't prevalent or hadn't even been conducted, perhaps, when this incident occurred. Right. That's right. Um, that's right. So I've learned from... Um, fire since that fire. Yeah, um, right. The, the, yeah, the research is is changing the way we look at some things, which is uh, proving to be very beneficial. Absolutely. Now I'm going to uh, switch gears just slightly and ask you uh, what the conversation sounded like when you went home. And I'm just curious: did you tell your wife what happened? And if you did, how did you explain this to her in such a way that it didn't uh, put the fear into her of how close you came to not coming home? We talked about it at the fire station um, in the form of an after-action review um, at the coffee table, bouncing around ideas. Um, we squared away things there. When I went home... I didn't say anything to my wife. Um, I generally tell her very little about what goes on at the station, about the fires that I've been in. Um, I didn't tell her until two years after a different situation um, that I couldn't take a deep breath for a couple of days because I'd sucked in some superheated air. Um, that brief situation was um, forcing a door, had my mask on, full PPE on, and when the door popped, the superheated air came out, 
and only then did I realize I had a mask problem. Um, it was engaged, but the heat came right through my uh, my mask, my regulator, took in a couple one fulls, and for a couple days, I couldn't take a deep breath. But I didn't tell her that because I'm probably very similar to most firefighters. I don't want my wife to worry. I've often heard her answer her uh, girlfriends when they ask, well, aren't you scared about, you know, John being a firefighter and all the fires he goes to? And, and she generally answers along the lines of she just doesn't think about it. Mm-hmm. And whether that's right, whether that's wrong, um, I think it's for every um, family unit to figure out for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, uh, I don't bottle up um, greatly some of the bad calls as far as, as um, the calls where there's been fatalities on the ambulance or uh, fatalities at fire scenes. I don't uh, really go into a shell. Um, she knows that she knows if I was um, on a fatal call because she watches the news. Mm -hmm. She knows my engine company. She knows the different parts of of our town, of where I would be responding to. And she might ask a question or two um, that are very um, non-confrontational or just supportive without really um, requiring a response. But no, I never, um, as far as I know to this day, she doesn't know about that situation. Um, because maybe my mindset is wrong, but I don't want to burden her with that thought, having two um, young daughters every time I go to work. Now she's thinking of this bad situation mm-hmm. that I was in. Um, I guess you know, I don't know you if know, that's John, there's a right or wrong, but that's, that's just normal, I think. There's a chance she's going to hear this podcast. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and... I will probably actually have have her listen to it. Um, I didn't tell her that I was going to do it this day or today, but I'll probably enough time has passed. She's um, been a firefighter's wife a little bit longer, um, you know. So all, all those things um, come into play. When she found out that uh, I couldn't take a deep breath for a couple of days, like I say, it was a couple of years later. And she just kind of rolled her eyes and gave me the that look. You know, mm-hmm. um, but uh, um, it'd be interesting to excuse me, see if the act when she does hear it. But I think to be a firefighter's wife, she has to have um, some confidence, um, some trust, some faith in, in me or um, the other wives and their husbands that they're going to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, she knows that I, I train a lot. Um, she knows that I joined, um, our local, um, fools group because I wanted to get some more off duty training. Um, she knows obviously how much time I spent preparing for my, uh, fire classes that I teach. So if, I think if, if her or any firefighter's wife looks at it logically and sees the preparation that, it, um, that we're putting into it, hopefully that's a small measure of comfort. Mm-hmm. Um, but she, I think she also knows that just in general, I'm not the guy to, to push the envelope um, on, you know, stupid, crazy things. Although most people would say going into the burning building is stupid, crazy. <laughs> but um, hopefully she realizes that I have a vested interest in coming home at the end of the shift. Mm-hmm. Now, um, um, I have a, a phrase that I use. Um, as I'm talking with firefighters in my classes, and I and I and I say we as firefighters always have to assume the risk of our job when we show up at an incident. In other words, the the work is inherently risky, and Correct. there's I don't think there's any way to avoid that other than to be always be you know exterior and always be defensive and and that's that's not the kind of firefighting that I advocate for. Uh, So I say that we are always going to assume risk when we arrive. But what I would hope that I can do 
my little piece of helping to advance the world is to help firefighters figure out how not to create risk. In other words, assume the risk, assume the risk, but don't create the risk. And I, I want to go back to something that you said where you said, you know, when I went in time number one, clearly justified all, you know, for all the right reasons. When I went in time number two, clearly justified for all the right reasons. When I went in time number three, uh, I'm not so sure this time. And in fact, I only went in three feet. And if I was going in to do a rescue, you know, I had already been in three feet and I knew there wasn't anybody in there, you know, three feet in. Um, would you say the third time you created the risk? Absolutely. Um, I think at that point, um, I'd accomplished my mission as far as um, any potential rescue in the fire room or in the hallway that led to what ended up being the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wasn't just going in for the fun of it, but at that that point, there was no reason for me to be in there Mm -hmm. Um, because I'd already checked the areas I could. Um, As soon as I felt that massive heat, um, I know I didn't have the conscious thought at the time, but I know that that amount of heat would have started cooking a victim if I had missed a victim in the room. Right. Um, but it, it still got to come back to, I created the risk that I didn't need to. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just thankful that I was aware of my surroundings and how massively the heat level and the smoke levels had changed. And and, and um, some and something <laughs> we won't, well, maybe we'll never know what, but something compelled you to not go any further than three feet in, because you could have you could have if you'd have been ten feet in, you wouldn't have made it back. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and the and the reason I only stopped three feet in was because. Even for me and um, my ability to take some heat, it was too hot. Uh, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have gone any further. Mm-hmm. Um, but had I, had I not come out the second time, I would have been deeper into the room. And if I had made it out, I would have come out uh, and gone straight over to the burn unit mm-hmm. and chances are I wouldn't have left the burn unit. And, yeah. you know, I, I know that. Right. Um, right. And I, I can even, I could justify not having come out the second time because I was still at a, at a, at a duck walk, um, a crouch, and I'd found the, the hallway that led to the kitchen. I could have easily justified moving down the hall just a few feet which only would have put me maybe, you know, 20 feet from the door. Mm -hmm. Um, I could see the door uh, underneath the smoke layer. But again, where's the common places for victims to be found? Main travel paths. Right. The hallway of a a one-story structure is is the main travel path. Right. So I easily could justify my reason for moving down that hall. Um, I I don't know why I didn't. I took a glance down the hall, but I think even then that little voice was starting to tell me, you need to be outside. Um, so I, I did not advance um, any further. And I know that there's going to be plenty of people listening that are going to be screaming and hollering that I was in there by myself um, with no hose line. And, and I understand that. Um, but, I think there, or hope there will be just as many people saying, no, nah, I can see why. A standard um, living room size that you can see from the front door, high likelihood of victims. Um, other guys are right there with the nozzle. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That would be me. I would make that push. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I can justify that. A lot of people um, won't. They... they Preach that you can't go into a fire without a charged hose line. Well, tell that to the truck companies of FDNY. 
they're in the fire above the fire day in and day out without the charged hose line. Mm -hmm. The ability that they have, that that's normal for them to do, their trust in their crews, um, their training, their experience, that's being aware of the situation there, and that's what um, makes it okay for them to do. Mm -hmm. Um, The training I had, the abilities I had, made it okay for me to do. Um, and you that may the, not work you, for somebody who gets a fire once a year, though. And you were under the belief that that hose line was going to be quick in behind you. you know, Absolutely you, you, right. You didn't know about that that little miscommunication disconnect between Correct. the operator and the and the folks at the nozzle. Correct. Yeah. As I was getting ready to enter the first time, I glanced over and I saw that they were finishing the stretch, and it kind of looked like it was going to be a little bit short, but. Um, there's always that last 15 feet that are curled up in the yard somewhere. Mm-hmm. And if they'd had that, we probably would have made the door. We could have done a knockdown from the door. So I'm going on, on past normal practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew, I knew the two guys who were operating the line. They yeah. weren't, they weren't rookies. Yeah. You know, now you had uh, said, uh, everything was going along according to plan. Right, right, right. Now, you had said a little bit earlier there's something about the little voice inside my head. Um, You know, there's some research done in neuroscience about the little voices in our head. Um, The term that we use is self-speak, and it's kind of like our conscious, or maybe I should say subconscious, talking to us. You know, not out loud, but nonetheless, you know, there's a little voice talking to us. So did you have that little voice inside your head talking to you as you were in there? Well, I wouldn't classify it as self-speak. It was more like self-yell. Because (laughs) at at the beginning, yeah, it was probably a a speaking. It was this typical, hey, what are you doing in here? And then as I continued, it's like, idiot, let's go. And by the end, he was yelling, yeah. You're, this is it's time to go. So yeah, it went from self speak to self yell. I would say, mm-hmm. um, and and I know, I know exactly that that's what it was. You know, um, it was my my brain telling me all these things are adding up, and the outcome is bad. It's mm-hmm. it's time to go. Did you? After once in my life, you know, I I listened to that little voice because how often do we not listen to that? Oh voice? yeah 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 yeah. Did did you? Uh... Did you have any feeling? Uh, in other words, not uh, necessarily the, the the self speak or self yell, but did you have you know did you have a gut feel that uh, things are turning bad? They're turning bad quick. This could end up being a uh, a less than desirable outcome for me. Did you have any any feelings or sensations of uh, of doom or anything like that that was coming over you? When I came face to face with the couch and and saw it off gas, I had this, uh, I guess, a sickening feeling. Hmm. Um, It was like I'd been punched in the stomach or slumped over the head. Hmm. And all of a sudden, I remember it, whatever it is, it clicked. You know, all those... um, hours spent watching videos and reading articles and reading books and all the hours I'd spent in fires, they just, it all slowed down. And all of a sudden it was like the, you know, the key in the lock, you hear that click and it, the door opens. Well, that clicks almost, almost perceptibly. I mean, obviously it was, it was in my mind, Mm -hmm. but it was almost like I had a conscious click that said, this is bad go because I didn't I, I just remember diving mm-hmm. I knew it, whether it was instinct whether it was the voice whether it was my subconscious brain mm-hmm. I knew that I needed to dive not crawl dive yeah you know, I, I wasn't trying to turn and, and go out slowly I knew it was time to dive so as you describe that sickening feeling or punched in the stomach um, you were you were getting that uh, proverbial gut feel 
uh, and that gut feel comes with different kinds of feelings for different kind of people. But for you, that gut yes. feel was a feeling of a sickening feeling and then a feeling of being punched in the stomach is almost like your brain is saying, look, John, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm just going to give you a good gut punch and try to get your Absolutely. attention. Yes? Absolutely. And yeah. ab ab absolutely. And sometimes, you know, as humans in life, that's what we need. We need that. You just need to be backhanded sometimes, yeah. you know. Um, and it just, I can remember um, thinking about it, and one of the pieces of, of that puzzle that caused the caused the click in my brain was hearing one of the other guys that I teach with talking about the studies that show how fast you can crawl um, and how fast, you know, heat and fire can travel. And, you know, you're basically looking at just a matter of feet, mm -hmm. you know, that you have the you know, ability to cross that distance on your hands and knees. Yeah, so in summary, and, we can't outrun it <laughs> or outcrawl no. it. <laughs> Once no, absolutely right. Yeah, right. If if I'm convinced, if if I'd been another two feet in, I would have gotten burned. Probably survived. I um, mean, we obviously can't we can't ever know that, but I would have um, at, at the minimum been burned pretty decently. Um, certainly, if I'd been another five or six feet in, um, yeah, I probably wouldn't have made it back on that one. Mm -hmm. um, but just the fact that as I turn, if I'm three feet in as I turn, my hands are only one foot in the door. Mm -hmm. You know, I dove and then went down, the fireball went up. Yeah. And I remember as I spun around and I looked back at, at the structure, my first thought was not, oh, wow, look what I just, you know, dove out of. It was, wow, that's cool. <laughs> you know, and then afterwards... I thought, oh, yeah, that could have been bad. Yeah, you know, it looks um, cool from the outside, it, but it wouldn't have been cool if you were on the inside. As yeah. a as a fire behavior event, it was really, I mean, it was classic. It was a big orange flame. It was massive. It was, it was powerful, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was it would have made a great photo. I mean, yeah. um, but it also could have had a completely different ending. Right, right. Well, John, uh, thank you for uh, giving me the gift of your time, and thank you on behalf of the listening audience for giving us the gift of your experience, because I think that sharing experiences like this will make smarter firefighters. And what I hope doesn't happen is that they look at your experience after the fact and find a way to be critical of you and the way that you found yourself in this situation, but rather look at the situation that you faced, put themselves in your boots, and consider the mission that you were trying to accomplish in the terms of all the circumstances, and say to themselves, I could find myself in the same spot that he was in, and then take the lessons that you shared and say, this might be the way not to get myself into into that same spot. So thank Absolutely. you for, uh, for, for giving us the, uh, the gift of your experience. Uh, thank you for, um, all the work that you do on your, um, traveling tours and your, um, your website and such, because you can only, uh, put it out there. It's, at some point we have to start taking responsibility for ourselves to uh, buy into the concept yes. that, um, the situational awareness, is just as important as putting on your gear. Yeah. Amen. Well, that's it. Episode 23 is complete. Or should I say episodes 22 and 23 are complete. Thank you, Captain John Lightly, for sharing your incredible close call survivor story over the last two episodes. If you've experienced or witnessed a near miss and would like to be interviewed on this show, visit the essaymatters.com website and click on the Contact Us link. Thank you in advance for sharing your lessons learned so that others may live. Thank you for sharing some of your valuable time over these last two episodes with me as well to listen. I sincerely appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. If you like the show, please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio and search for SA Matters Radio and subscribe to the podcast and leave your feedback in a five-star review. 
I can't, cannot begin to tell you how valuable I find your feedback and how it inspires me to work even harder. It will also help others to find the show. You can sign up for the free Essay Matters monthly newsletter by visiting the essaymatters.com site and clicking on the red box on the right side of the homepage. And remember to be watching for the essaymatters.com announcements for the changes that I spoke about in the beginning of episode 22. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit essaymatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gasway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgasway.com.